Just watching politics tonight, digging beyond the headlines. Now let's get to our interview with the guest of the day. I am joined by a lawyer and chieftain of the All Progressives Congress, APC, Cletus Owen, for discussion on the sack of Kano State Governor by the Tribunal. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Cletus. It's good to see you again. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, before the lawyers will take me to the cleaners, I am not a lawyer. I'm an analyst. I'm a, law, a former lawmaker and a, an academic, a scholar. So right. uh, just for the record, I am not a lawyer. Right. right. Thank you for joining us uh, once again. So in the course of the program, we will be talking about uh, other national issues. But let's kick off with this very interesting development. Six months after the APC candidates, the candidates of your party, Nassil Gawana conceded defeat. The Kano State Election Petitions Tribunal has now invalidated the victory of NNPP in the state. How will you react to that judgment? Yes, the judgment uh, indeed uh, is giving us a good, uh, a good omen. It's a good omen for democracy that today our judiciary is very firm. Uh, I am not going to join the many Nigerians who imagine that all we are about democracy is about election winning and losing. It's about the effect and impact of elections. And today's judgment in Kano State only goes back to show that the people took a decision which was being violated. And the restoration of that decision by way of the judgment that comes from the tribunal is something to remember. Clearly, you cannot benefit from wrongdoing. That is what the tribunal has simply said. You cannot benefit from wrongdoing, given that the votes that were purportedly earned or ascribed to a candidate were not valid votes. Uh, the Electoral Act, the new Electoral Act, needs to be studied very seriously so that even lawyers do not mislead the public into emotional reactions rather than dealing with the facts and the law. The law, in fact, is so blind to emotions that you see the lady law blindfolded, ready to cut into pieces any wrongdoing. Therefore, what happened in Kano State today, for me, was another vindication that our democracy has come of age and that the enthronement of democracy in Nigeria, especially our judiciary, has kudos to it. Uh, APC, PDP, APGA, Labour, they are losing and winning in different states. I think... For me, it is a cocktail of democratic dividends, and the courts are living up to expectation. Right. So it's also very interesting to see that the tribunal said INEC shouldn't have declared Governor Yusuf winner of the election. What does this say about that election? Well, you, you are aware that there are several grounds, about four or five grounds upon which an election can be challenged. One of them being the validity of votes cast, the qualification or non-qualification of candidates, and of course, the issue of compliance, which the Supreme Court has severally, from 1979, interpreted to mean substantial compliance. And in this case, there was no substantial compliance, having regard to the number of votes that were cast, the gap or the margin of winning, in this case, NNPP was supposed or was awarded or given 1,019,602 votes. And APC was given 890,705 votes. That made NNPP to lead with 128,897 votes. Now, upon inspection, as was demanded and requested, and the basis for the challenging of that election was the invalidity, that is, that some of the votes cast were not valid votes. And the vote upon recounting and examination by the trial court discovered that 165,663 votes neither had the stamp nor the signature of the presiding officer as required by the Electoral Act. That means you could have just picked a, bread, a, a paper on the roadside and just on print on it and it becomes a ballot paper. What validates a paper and what makes a vote valid or invalid is the appropriate steps 
that are prescribed by the Electoral Act read conjunctively with the Constitution of Nigeria, which gives INEC the power to even bring out guidelines. When all the three, the guidelines, the Electoral Act as amended and the Constitution as amended are violated because the sanctity of the vote is dependent on the validity as enshrined in the law. And that law says you must thumbprint and that thumbprint must be countersigned by a presiding officer after a clerk has handed you the ballot. So having not passed through that litmus test of signature and stamp, I next time to show that this vote has been cast. It means that vote could have been put into that ballot paper, into that ballot box after voting must have taken place. Therefore, it cannot count. And so when they took away 165,663 votes, it left NNPP with 853,939 votes. If you put 890,000 votes against 853,939 votes, you are going to bring out APC winning with 36,766 votes. Now, the next thing to, uh, uh, to do, that is to say, the total number of votes cast were in favor of APC by 36,000 after that deduction. But beyond that, you have to win 25% in, of, to third of the local government, 44 local governments in Kanu State. Both parties met the two-third, the two-third, 25% in the two-third. But the total number of valid votes cast were now, after the deduction, in favor of APC. That is the government. That is the major, major plank upon which that election collapsed and upon which APC was declared winner. Because the number of valid votes were now 36,766 as against the 36,000, more than the 853,939 votes that NNPP got after the deduction of 165,663 votes, leaving now APC with 890. Now the question is, why did they not deduct the votes of APC? The reason is simple. The court, by the cliche and mantra of law, is not a father Christmas. It does not give what you do not go. And it is not, the court cannot go onto a voyage of discovery to see whether a, a, APC also had, because there was no counterclaim or counter petitioning of the APC votes. All that went to before the judges was that these votes were not valid, count them and discover that they are not valid. And they did just that. Nobody challenged the 890,000 votes of APC. So the court was not going to go like, a, like children looking for biscuits on a dining table. They couldn't have gone on to that kind of voyage looking for votes or valid or invalid votes. It is what they were asked to do that they went ahead to do. And finding their finding, which was germane, which was unchallenged, which was unimpeachable, of course, that again will be tried by the next the appellate court. That is where the matter will go to. It will get up to the Supreme Court, and we are going to see how lack of stamping and how lack of signature of a presiding officer is going to be obtained, and how those 165,663 votes are going to be invalidated or left there by the appeal court and by the Supreme Court. So we are still a long way to go. The 180 days meant for the tribunal is gone. We are now going for the next uh, 180 days for the, uh, for the appeal court and then to the Supreme Court. Thereafter, the matter will be settled. But I think this finding is simply solid on solid rock on all fours with our laws, with the Electoral Act, with the Constitution, and with the guidelines of INEC. I think that is where we are, and uh, we, are here to t we are going to test that law. And uh, I expect that NNPP will exercise their constitutional right to go on appeal to test our Constitution, test our laws, and test the new Electoral Act. Because I must say this over and over, it is difficult for me to believe that most lawyers have not even studied the new Electoral Act as amended. So much is in it that it is going to take us more time for people, even lawyers, even senior lawyers, to understand what is embedded in the new Electoral Act, the last amendment of the Electoral Act. It is so complicated, it is so watertight, but like you know, no law is perfect because everything human has its limitations. Perfection is an attribute of the divine. It is not a human attribute to be perfect. So we can't say that man made by man is perfect. Mr. Curtis, I hear you, but let's look at the numbers again. 165,000 
663 votes uh, from the NNPP vote has been described as invalid and this is huge for a party if we must admit and a lot of persons are already questioning this decision in your own view why do you think people may be questioning this decision the reason is because they didn't participate in the procedures and those who are questioning it naturally will will be members of the NNPP who expect that their votes shouldn't be deducted even when they were seen to be invalid I mean, for that kind of physical inspection, what the lawyers will call a locus inquo. In other words, there was practical counting of votes, primary evidence. It was not secondary evidence. It was not a matter of they were or they ought to be. This is what is. These are the votes. Let's look at the balance. And there was inspection. And that is why at each time at the beginning, and the Electoral Act makes provision for it. So we have cogent and verifiable reason to believe that these votes didn't have their ballot stamped and didn't have the signatures of the presiding officer. These two elements are key to the validation of a ballot. And having been missing, it is only left for the trial court to take, in any case, don't forget that in the trial of a case of this nature, especially special cases, what is called the sui generi cases, like the tribunal cases, the election matters, it is only natural that you must as much as possible. Look not just at the demeanor of witnesses, but also at the primary evidence available, in this case, the ballot papers. So it is impossible, not difficult, it is impossible to go back and say that there were stamps and there were signatures, and the tribunal decided to go blind on those two elements that validates a ballot. Without those two elements, there is no other way. It's as good as getting a plain paper, a plain ballot paper, even a valid ballot paper with a stamp and the signature without a thumbprint, without a thumbprint, is still invalid. That is the law. You can have a correct ballot paper signed with a stamp, but no thumbprint. It will still be invalid. So the elements that make a ballot valid must all be there. Number one is that there is a thumbprint. There is a tick on the voter's register, and then the ballot is handed to a voter, who goes to a secret place to thumbprint and fold it in the open and put into the ballot box. Those are the elements and the steps outlined by law. They are not optional. They don't have option. Even for those people who are physically challenged, like those who don't have print, the law makes provision for them to vote and how to vote. Even the blind people are all, who are uh, physically blind have a provision in our laws on how to vote. Those who cannot read and write have a provision in our laws on how to vote. So four elements must coerce, must coincide, must emerge to give you a valid voter and a valid vote in a ballot for any election and all elections for that matter. So if people are complaining, it is natural for them to complain about the number, 165,000. But that is what it is. Those are facts. If they are not... We are going to, to upstairs, like the lawyers will say. We will go upstairs, go to the next court, and show. Of course, you are not going for a fresh trial. It is the same ballot you must tender. And of course, you are going to package that back to the appeal court to say, we are challenging this because this particular number of ballots were thumbprinted and the signatures and stamp were there, but the trial right. court... So now that, uh, now that the, the tribunal has delivered the letters... Physical evidence. Right. So now that the tribunal has delivered this judgment, but it's still a long way in the race. And as a speaker, 24-hour curfew has been declared in Kano State. How will you advise both parties to conduct themselves? Well, like you, we have all agreed here, this is not the end of the road. In any case, both for this election and for all of us still living, 2024, we no longer have four years. We have already spent four months. We are going to our fourth month, May, May 29th. We have June, July, August. We are going to the fourth month. In the next few days, we have made four months. So it is no longer four years. It is now going to be less than four years, and there will be another election. So it is not as if, I mean, look at the last president who left here. Four times he contested and won only at the fourth when we used to talk about Abraham Lincoln, it was as if it was far country, some fairy tale. But we have our own president. We have even our own uh, uh, 
um, a, a, a vice, former vice president, Atiku Abubakar. How many times has he contested? 2007 in AC, 2011, he, could, he went for the primaries and lost. 2015, he came back, contested the primaries, contested elections. 2019, this is 2020. He is still there. He has not carried guns to the street. So the Kanu people are a great people. They have been very cosmopolitan. They have been very democratic. They have been playing the best form of democratic politics and progressive politics right from Aminu Kanu. So I am not sure that they are going to destroy that legacy. And Aminu Kanu should not be ruffled in his grave to discover that those he brought up and the legacy he left are now going to become bandits and become hooligans in the name of elections. Kanu must be left to be at peace, both APC, NNPC, and the PDP uh, members should all sheath their swords and wait to use the ballot rather than the bullets. We don't need swords. We don't need clubs. We need ballot and we need thumb printing. And the law is now to be tested. And we can still wait for another three years and thereafter we go to contest. The people who are even contesting, Nasir and his uh, brother, uh, both Gauna and uh, Yusuf, are young people. They are not old people. In the next four years, they won't be going away. They are not going to be older than uh, uh, Atiku. They are not going to be older than Peter Obi. So they still have a chance to contest the election. So there is no need for any supporter to jump to the streets. And it is the time for them to show statesmanship. By coming to issue statements to, and do broadcast on state radio and national television like this and tell their supporters that this is not the end of the road. They still have two steps to go. The appeal court and the Supreme Court. So there is no need and there is no need to do. If you now make the place ungovernable, if you now make the place that it will be a state of emergency, the law allows for state of emergency in Kano, where a part of the state is in our constitution, the national, the federal government, the sovereign, that is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces of the Federal Republic of, uh, of Nigeria, in this case, Ashwadi Bolaman, will be forced and will be mandated by court and by the, by the National Assembly to proceed to declare a state of emergency if the place becomes over. In that way, it should be loser, it will be lose lose for all of them. But it is a win win now because there's still a chance to go to the appeal court, a chance to go to the Supreme Court. I don't see anybody going to pick because the very brothers you want to rule, the very brothers you want to govern and provide good governance to and bring dividends of democracy cannot be the very ones whose blood you want to spill. I don't think that is the whole essence of elections and electioneering. Our enemy today can become an ally tomorrow. So there is no permanent enemy. There is no permanent friend. All right, then. So, so this judgment was delivered virtually. Uh, why did you think that happened? And uh, what's the implication of this for justice delivery in the country? Justice delivery. The three man panel the last delivered. Few weeks. Okay. So Sadebe and her colleagues in the bench came out with what they found. They are not infallible. That is why there's an appellate court. But the justice delivery system in our country, I Mr. insist... Mr. Clessons, kindly hold on. Did you get my question? This judgment was delivered virtually. So I'm asking, why did you think that happened? And what's the implication of this for justice delivery in the country? We are going digital, my dear sister. We are going digital. I remember the case of Al Gore. Al Gore's judgment against the junior Bush. The judge was fishing, and when they called him for the judgment, he said they should go to the net. Please go and confirm this. He was fishing. He had written his judgment and delivered it and put it on the net and asked them to go and read it. He didn't sit anywhere to read it. And this is where I pity our judges. We must improve. You can imagine that judges are still up till today taking longhand notes when lawyers are in court. You have 10, 15 lawyers going for four, five uh, appellants or four, five uh, 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 litigants. And a judge is made to write in longhand and read in longhand. We must graduate to that stage in which judgments can just be put there. If we are reading this judgment today in the thing, there should be a website for that. And then you just put it there. You don't need to go and sit down anywhere. How many judges do we have? And that is why they age so fast. I don't have any envy for those in the bench especially. Because keeping them sitting down there, they age so fast and they wear out so early. Because of the volume of work to be done. So doing this virtually, 
First of all, the pressure of going to sit in that court, most of the time you go to some courts, there is no light, there is no uh, generator, you don't have even the public power supply system, and then there are no fans, there are no air conditioners. And they are sweating there to read 50, 60 pages of judgment. Sometimes, when they now read part of it, especially in election cases, and say, this is the summary of our judgment, we shall explain later. They say, oh, they have gone to collect money. So when they now give it to you virtually from where it, it is convenient for them, you turn around and say, why do you do it virtually? Why do you deal with digital technology and turn around to uh, uh, tell, if you are delivering lectures in the universities, where people earn degrees that they come and walk in, why will a judge not deliver his judgment from the comfort of his home, using it virtually? What's wrong with that? If international conferences that shape the world and bring the uh, 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 succor to the world, security to the world, can be done virtually. We saw it during the COVID-19. Didn't we do it? Did the world collapse because we are doing things virtually? On the contrary, it is even more authentic because you can't edit it. Because everybody right. is recording it. So it is even more authentic to do it virtually. So it is recorded and cast in stone and iron, saved in the clouds, and then you can now refer to it anytime, any day, from anywhere. And everybody has access to it. Because with a small right, phone, Claire, with a button, you are onto the judgment. And I don't think there is anything wrong with that. I want to see more of that. I want to see more of such technology deployed to our legal system. Look at what happened during the trial in the presidential uh, election petition uh, uh, court in Abuja. Somebody was almost lynched. If he was in his house watching it virtually, only the lawyers and the judges in court. You were going there, we are not going to vote in court. You are going there, you are not going to go and, uh, and, and, and do a wrestling match. It's not a football match to say we are part of a team. So what are you doing in court? You can watch it virtually right, and it's being televised like the, judge, the final judgment live. So I don't see anything why the judgment being done virtually should raise suspicion. On the contrary, we should give kudos to the judiciary for this innovation for meeting up with right. modern technology. So like I, like I pointed out earlier, uh, Gawana had earlier considered defeat after announcement of that result. I mean, I remember him saying as a Muslim, he's compelled to accept the outcome of that result whether in his favor or whether or not in his favor. So what lesson can people learn from this? Precisely another Jonathan in the making. When Jonathan made that wonderful call in 2015 to accept defeat and insisted that no blood of a Nigerian, his electoral victory is not worth the blood of any Nigerian. That is what the governors of this world have demonstrated. He has shown that he's a, a great Christian, a great uh, Muslim, he has shown that he is spiritually very deep and accepts the will of God in his life because if all power belongs to God and God is the giver of all good things, then he accepts it. And look at the way God has come out now. I expect that the followers and supporters of the NNPP who are gearing for war in Kanu, war does, after such a war, a war of this nature is a war of attrition. It's a holocaust, a political holocaust. What you have there are going to be survivors. They are not going to be any winners because the place will be ungovernable. So even if they give it to you, you too cannot, because no man living on this planet can claim monopoly of peace or violence. So All it right. is only exemplary of Gauna to do what he did. He is a replica and a reincarnate of the author of progressive politics in Kanu, State Aminu Kanu. I would like to see more of such young people come out to do elections, contest elections, and leave the will of the people to flow. And right. he never made any rancor about it, never went to the social media attacking judges. I'm happy also that even Yusuf, Abba Yusuf, who was sitting there, one of his commissioners was known to have threatened the judges, and he was removed on the spot. He didn't waste time, meaning that both of them are peaceful. Therefore, their supporters should follow suit. I have not heard that even the leader of that party, Kwan Kwasu himself, Engineer Kwan Kwasu himself, nor the leader of the AMPP, the national chairman of uh, uh, APC, Dr. Ganduje. I have never seen any of them in any ventrolic, in any hot exchange, or issuing orders, or doing anything that would threaten the public peace. Their followers should right. not, therefore, cry louder than they believe. Otherwise, it will be suspicious that it is not these people that they are supporting, and that those are not their leaders. If a Dr. Ganduje, right. national chairman, could accept the fifth and there was peace, I expect that Kanu should be at peace by this time. So the curfew in Kanu is oh. timely, is proactive, is preventive. But we should have less of that. I want to see the, the governorship candidate of the two parties come out to address their supporters by tomorrow morning. I want to see them do that.
So, I mean, over the years, our elections continue to be determined by courts. What's the implication of this for the country's democracy? And why should courts have the final say? Until the political class, now I speak as a political actor in this country. I am not going to speak here as an APC member. I speak now as a national, as a patriot. I love this country sufficiently and I have maintained. In the last five years, I've not gone to any other country. I have remained here. Not because I can't afford it. I've had conferences to attend in and out of here, even within African countries. I have told myself that I cannot be seen to be doing holiday anywhere. Anything that I want, any temperature can be here. The courts, until the political class and actors become less desperate and make politics a profession rather than a career or vocation, until they stop making it a profession, you cannot meet a man and you say, who are you? And you say, I'm a politician. How can a medical doctor be a politician? He's a professional in politics. I'm an academic. I'm a journalist. I am not a politician. I am a professional in politics. I teach in the university. I don't come here to come and start telling people I'm a politician. Until young people leave the universities and use their hands and their brains to add value to society and to community, then we are still going to have this level of desperation parading as political service. People telling you, you want to serve people, and they reject you in the ballot. You turn around and say the community must go down. The country must go down because they didn't accept you. When a messenger begins to force himself, there is a maxim in labor law. You cannot force a servant on an unwilling master. You cannot force yourself on the people you want to serve. If you begin to force yourself to go on a message nobody sent you, it is suspicious that that message, you are not a good messenger. You are going for that message for yourself in your own personal selfish skewed interest. It is not in the common good. Therefore, the courts will continue to intervene because if there was no law, we'll be living in a bizarre state of nature where the violent take it by force. It is on account of this that society is ruled by rules, is ruled by rules, governed by governments. And that is why we say that outside God, the biggest element of control of the bestiality in man is government. Beyond the Almighty, who takes the final decision on all things, the next in command is government, not individuals. And that is why when you say that you will need to have Strong institutions, that's a strong government that all of us put together must hold the bestial man, must hold the animalistic man, the animal in us, and put all it right. down to conform. Otherwise, you could as well, when people tell you that there's freedom to speak, freedom to say anything, to do anything. So can we say that it is, I have freedom to just pick up a knife or a gun and say that the only person I want to see to kill is an American? Any American I see, I must kill. That I have freedom to do that. Can I do that? Can any man say that? Can you say that because these right, people Mr. are not Clatus. good people, the bookie people must always eat? So we have, uh, gov until the class, the political class begins to conform. Imagine that political parties can't even obey their own rules and their own constitution. All right. So even Mr. Clatus, let's take a break. Like it happened in Imo, where you move the venue, like when you move the venue of a primary to an appeal, and the Supreme Court of Nigeria tells you, for doing that, you can't contest election. And I neck right. and others manipulate the system to go and still contest.